Well, I'm Mark Lerner. I'm one of the co-founders of Founder Technologies. Um, he will be at our uh, facility a little bit later today because I do the after party. And um, I guess to start things off is how did I get here today? It's a little bit unusual for me to be standing on a stage like this. This is not my normal domain. Um, I'm not the type of person who likes to stand up and speak to a lot of people talking about things that I've done or things that the company has done. Um, but Mike Schuld and Amanda Schuld, who are part of the organizers here and have been with Founded for a very long time, Mike has, came and asked, and it was really hard to say no, so that's how I landed here. Um, after I said yes, which is a mistake, I went out and looked at the um, website for today, and I looked at the other speakers, and I was like, I'm way over my head, because I'm not a tech guy, I'm not a developer, that's not my skill set. And so very quickly I started to feel like, maybe I'm not the right person here. Um, because this is not necessarily, you know, if you've come in here you want me to give you some wisdom on how to best code and things like that, that's definitely not me, so I'm going to apologize in, the advance, or in advance for that. However, as I started realizing that I was already committed, um, and I started reflecting and kind of preparing for today, um, I realized that I've had 27 years of experience in Montana doing high tech, and that probably is fairly unique. Um, not a lot of people have had that opportunity, going all the way back to 1990. Um, so 1990, I was a student at Montana State University. I worked for a company called Extended Systems that hired students to do basically um, frontline support and sales for their tech company. This is before the internet for all intents and purposes. So we were doing products for uh, making five to $15,000 laser printers work better in offices. So that's what we basically did. Then they kept on expanding out to solve different types of problems. But through my entire college career, I was able to work in a tech industry to kind of set the tone for the rest of my career without necessarily realizing I was doing it at the time. 1998, I went to work for Right Now. If there's any Right Nowers here, I decided to go old school. This is a really old logo. One of the first ones that they had. So in 1998, uh, Right Now was just starting. Uh, I had been doing my own thing for a period of time, was getting bored of that, and I saw this opportunity to go work for Right Now. Um, submitted my application, and literally the next morning at like 8 o'clock in the morning, Greg Gianforte called me on the phone and said, we want to get you in here for an interview. It was all based off of what I had done in Extended Systems, which really wasn't that much from a tech perspective, but at that time, he's like, you understand the internet, you understand what internet software is, and you're in Montana, you're basically hired. So it wasn't that hard to, to, to get a job there. Um, so I was at right now from 1998 to 2003, um, and in that time frame, I was first their salesperson, I was their next, then I was their first sales manager, um, I opened up their international offices with, with other people in London, in Munich, in Australia, in Sydney, Australia. Um, I ran their German office for a period of time. So I had a lot of sales experience. So if I'm starting to talk about the business side, it's because it's all I know. Um, understand that. 2003, um, passion was gone, so I quit. I didn't really enjoy it that much anymore. Um, decided I was going to go do my own thing. I was a stay-at-home dad for a year. Best job ever, I can tell you that right now. 2004, and this is hopefully the only thing where I come across truly bragging, I skied a million vertical feet at Big Sky. So, it's a really good job to have. But in 2005, Darren Nordhagen, um, who was a friend of mine who I'd met at Extended Systems, who I had recruited to right now, called me up and said, hey, I've got this business opportunity, I know you're not currently working, I'm currently out of my thing right now, and I wanna start this company. And so um, he asked me about Founded Technologies. Now, it wasn't called Founded at the time, um, but basically Founded is we make software for the philanthropic sector, okay? So the initial idea was making software for grant-making organizations, people who give money away. That's what we did. When he called and asked me about it, I thought when he said foundation software, I thought he meant like concrete. You know, I didn't realize that there was this whole additional sector to work with. Um, but since that time, since 2005, over the past you know, 10, 12 years, we've grown found into 67 employees. Um, we have three different product lines. We have 1,200 clients on one product line, 300 on another, and about 150 community foundations who are using our system as well. So, um, kind of been through this over the past uh, 27 years. So, 
what I plan on talking about today is just uh, kind of giving you guys some ideas on, you know, if you're planning on starting a new company, some things to consider. And as I was reviewing this today, I took a very ne negative tone, um, and I'm gonna apologize for that, you know, in advance. Uh, starting your own company is amazing, but there are some things to be aware of as you're looking at doing that. And where a lot of this topic came from is when Mike was convincing me to do this, he said, hey, 75% of the people here are either thinking about starting their own business someday, have just recently started their own business, or are working for a startup. And so some of this could be very relevant. So I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about starting your own business, okay? Next thing I'll talk about is scaling your business, specifically in Montana, but scaling your business as a whole. Um, opportunities and challenges for high tech here in Montana, and then kind of just a wrap up with where, you know, where we go from here and leave time for discussions and comments from all of you as well, okay? So, there we go. Um, couple of disclaimers. <laughs> um, so first one is, uh, this is 100% my opinion. This is observations, this is anecdotes. As I said, I'm not comp or competent to come here and talk to you about technical things. Um, that are you know, you know, based off of research and things like that, that you guys are way more uh, capable than I am in that particular area. And also, I will be using right now as examples in several different points. Um, obviously, Craig's been in the news a ton recently. Please don't wrap that up in any of my discussions today. It has nothing to do with politics whatsoever. It has everything to do with my experiences working for that organization. So hopefully, um, you can let wherever your politics may land, kind of go so you are able to hear what I actually am trying to say. So, entering a startup. So, as I said, I know that as I go through the rest of these slides, um, I have maybe a slightly negative tone as far as the things to look out for. But So before I get into that, I will talk about um, founding technology has been the single most uh, rewarding thing I've ever done. So starting with a brand new company and taking it through the entire process has been fantastic. It's, it's, so I don't want to dissuade people who really have that, but it's taught me some major lessons um, in life as we go through. So first one I want to talk about is just the big why. A lot of people start companies and they really don't go through this process. Obviously, you don't start your own business if you're not looking for financial reward. Everyone's going to have that as some component of what they do. Companies I've, inter I've encountered where that's their only component, they tend to not be very successful because they're missing kind of a higher calling or what it is. Now this does tie into vision, you know, so obviously you have to have a plan of where you're trying to get to, but it also is more personal than that if you are the, the founder or co-founders. There's things that you have to ask yourself and understand why it is that you're willing to take this adventure um, and understand that that's gonna impact how you run your company and um, the, just the things that you have to think about and do on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm gonna take you through a couple of examples. So at Greg, Greg Gene Fry, as I said, you know, he picked up the phone, called me at 8 in the morning, I interviewed directly with him. Um, at my interview, Greg told me that his goal, now keep in mind, this is on North 7th, just past the interstate, in the back of a realty executive's office in a building, you know, in, in a room that's maybe uh, 15 or, uh, you know, 30 feet long by 15 feet long. Um, and at that, and, and at that time their sales was maybe 25 to $30,000 a month. And he told me, and I'll never forget it, our goal is we're going to build sales to a $20 million run rate, we're going to take this thing public, and we're going to create a ton of jobs. And he said, you know, and after we really create the software, we get things going, we're going to turn around, we're going to come back, and I'm going to try and create call centers here in Montana so we can create even more jobs. This is like very, very, very beginning, and he knew exactly what he was trying to accomplish and why he wanted to do it. And I mean, he was right. I mean, he nailed it. Um, he even did try to do the call center thing. It didn't work. But he knew exactly what he was trying to accomplish when he set out from the very, very, very beginning. And this impacted right now his culture. It impacted their focus. And it really impacted the day-to-day in some good ways and some bad ways. So at, at right now, growth was key. Make no mistake, everything was about growth. If we had a good month, we knew that we were gonna have three to five to 10 new people working with us next week. You know, he was, that, everything was about growth. If we didn't have a good month, we were wondering who was still gonna be with us next week. So it was all about growth from the very, very beginning. 
In 2008, we doubled the company, both in size and sales quarterly, for pretty much the entire year. We missed it on, the, on Q4, but that's remarkable growth. Um, wasn't necessarily always fun, but there was no doubt what, what was trying to be accomplished when you were at right now. Second thing that was kind of a thing that affected how Greg's vision was and, what, and why he was doing it was you were either on the boat rowing or you were off. There was no in between. You drank the Kool-Aid or you were gone. Um, that was just the reality of what that organization was. And I chose a rowboat rather than the skull. I chose the ocean ones because that's exactly what it felt like kind of going through, through those uh, first few years. Other thing, uh, if you've ever heard Greg talk, he'll, you know, he's big on bootstrapping, but the moment that the cost to grow started to be greater than what sales could bring in, he went looking for VC. Because above, above and beyond anything else, he was gonna take that company public. You know, it was a drive. He wasn't gonna grow it naturally. Bootstrapping went out the window when it was no longer gonna allow us to make it through the window that he saw in his mind going forward. So it, it was totally a, a, a driven per, uh, component in his mind. And then kind of finally, and this I'm way over here on the opinion spectrum on this one, but I think this is why Greg ultimately sold to Oracle because he had accomplished his goal. He had taken the company public. He, and he kind of found that maybe running a public company wasn't as much fun as, as he thought. Um, and he accomplished his goal. So that's where he ultimately landed with Oracle. If you would ask me, and I, I was gone before, and actually I'd already started and found it by the time they went um, sold to Oracle. But if you would ask me if they would ever sell, sell to Oracle, I'd been, no way, absolutely positively not. Um, and they did, you know, and I think that this has a lot to do with it. So, in contrast, um, I'm, gonna talk, I'm gonna walk you through kind of Foundant's perspective. And so, Foundant kind of started with four people, um, and actually Case Cannon is sitting right over here, is one of them, so he's one of our founders as well. But it was Darren Nord Nordhagen, Case Cannon, myself, and Chris Stahl sitting around Darren's um, kitchen table talking about this opportunity. You know, we knew there was a chance to go do this. We had someone who was willing to put in a couple hundred thousand dollars to, to let us go do this opportunity. He'd given us some ideas. We, we had a framework. But, you know, did we really want to take on this uh, activity that is, you know, really life consuming? And Darren turned around and looked at it and he made this nugget um, saying, hey, I, I've quit every job that I've ever had because part of it started to suck. And it, there's a valid point to that. And, and it wasn't things like, hey, they took away the beer cooler and that type of stuff. It was things like, you know, they didn't deliver on their promises. I went out and sold something and the company didn't follow through. People didn't have my back. Senior management quit treating customers and employees like equal partners, those types of things. And that's really driven Foundin's why. So our, really, our primary why is to create a company that's fundamentally different than any other company that's out there. We try to consistently do things differently. Um, our number one goal is do the right thing. Um, and we live by that. You know, if we have six goals, everyone knows that goal, not everyone knows all six goals, but this is something we try to live by on a day-to-day -day basis. And this has impacted Foundance culture as well, our focus and our day-to-day. -day. One of the big things is that as we bring in profits, we're not di di diving everything into growth. We're dumping half of it into growth, the other half into employees, the other half into customers. We don't need to do that. Um, just through the growth, we're creating plenty of opportunities, but it's part of just how we tend to operate. We look at things from a very different perspective. We're not quite as bottom line oriented, which I'll talk about in a second. Kind of results of that is, you know, we have a life, we've been going for 10 years where we've been actively having customers and doing renewals. We have a lifetime renewal rate of 95%, actually over 95%. Um, we haven't lost very many employees. We have a, an employee retention rate of 90%. Um, people tend, you know, and, and I think a big part of that is the fact that as an ownership group and as, and, and everybody kind of gets absorbed in this as well, is treat people the way you want to be treated. It kind of creates an environment where people don't want to leave. There are some, you know, consequences to that. You know, take that same component. Our profit margin has been slim for the last 10 years. We dump every last dollar in back into the company to continue to grow it. But for every dollar we're dumping into the company, we're dumping another dollar into other things as well. It has 
kept us from growing as quickly as we probably could if we had a different tack. Also, um, when our costs for growth increase, you know, greater than sales, we've taken on debt. And, you know, that sounds great because we have no VC at, at Founded at all um, after this many, this many years. Um, and we've taken on some pretty large, we've built some new products. We just acquired a company last summer. Um, as we've come across needs for, for dollars, we've turned around and taken debt instead. But that is me, Darren, um, Chris, and others signing our name saying, yeah, we'll put our personal guarantee that we're good for this. So it's, it's, it's a different perspective than, than having other people's money. But we felt that that's super important for us because by taking VC money, um, to be fair to the VC, we don't feel like we could turn around and maybe make some of the decisions that we make that are a little bit more longer term. So our growth has been a lot slower. We've grown at, we've grown at a 30% annual rate. We're growing faster now. Um, we're not on the same track. We've made a personal decision to try and do things a little bit differently. So if this is a, a, a direction you're thinking about going, Having a really strong understanding of why it is that you want to do it is super important. Understand and, and understand that as you make that, people are going to hold you accountable for it. If we suddenly try to change our direction, I guarantee you our employees and our customers would hold us accountable. They would come to us and be like, no way, you can't do this. You, know, you guys are changing who you are, you're changing the company. We would lose our employees, we would lose our customers. So you know, that why is something that can set a track that is really, really hard to change down the road. So I, I encourage you to think about it. All right, next, cons, or next uh, component as far as startups. Do you have a concept or do you have a company? Um, this is one thing that's, you know, a lot of people walk around, they're like, I've got this company. They don't have a company, they have a concept. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a second. But um, there's nothing wrong with being in concept mode. I listed in, for Founded that I was there from 2005 until 2000, or, or we started founding in 2005, but we didn't actually take offices, form, form the company, etc., until 2007. So we consider this our 10-year anniversary. We spent a little over a year in the concept mode. Concept mode is free. I mean, it's your time, but you're not spending money nearly as quickly as, as you want to do. And there's a ton of work that goes into concept mode. Company, on the other hand, you know, now you have employees, now you have customers, etc. So a couple things to kind of, just from past experience, to kind of keep in mind. Um, at right now, if anyone's a right now, or if you've ever heard Greg speak, you've heard him say this. You know, nothing happens until someone sells something. This was like, you know, you had to say it every morning as you're walking into the office type of thing. Um, and it's true. You're not a company until you can actually get someone to buy your product and give you pro give you money. And if you're a software and you know, software service or subscription oriented, you know, really you're not a company until you prove that you can kind of hit the renewals and make that happen on a consistent and regular basis as well. My only complaint on the, you know, nothing happens until someone sells something that Greg just touts so much, because I am a big believer in it, is he tended to focus 100% on the sales part. And because I'm not technical, I tend to focus more on the something thing. Because it's, a, it's an equal pairing, you know? If you're out there and you're trying to sell um, vaporware, it's a really crappy job. You know, uh, on the other hand, if you cut salespeople out there selling something that doesn't exist, that's a really crappy job. So, you know, relationships between the developers and the salespeople are extremely important from this component. All right, next thing I wanted to hit on, um, resilience. So, if you're gonna start your own company, you need to be able to roll with the punches because sometimes it happens. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Things can kind of go wrong at any given point in time. And so, just in my career, there's been some pretty big ones. First one, um, Tech Bubble of 2000. Impacted me personally because right now I was about to go public. I was still working for the company. I was in London at the time. We had just hired all the, we had just hired, I don't know how many people on this, hey, we're about to go public, and they pulled it. It was the right decision to make, but oh man, what a gut punch. Um, for all of these people that had expectations of what was going to happen, it took them four more years before they were actually able to go public. So, you know, that's not anybody's fault, but you had to roll with it. And I can't imagine Greg's thought process and Susan Carsonson and the other people who were leadership at that time, what they went through making that, you know, all of a sudden the business world just ground to a halt. Um, and again, 
At that time, I was working in Germany. I was the, the director of the German offices. And the effect of that is by the beginning of October, three weeks later, I was shuttering the business because every job that we took away in Germany, we closed the entire company or the entire German office, saved two jobs back here in, in the US. And so that decision wasn't mine to make. But um, again, huge lesson that I learned on right when I was dying, but it was really hard. That was a terrible thing to go through, and it affected me for a long, long time. And I think it has kind of a part of the reason why Foundant has the tone that it does, is because you know, looking people in the eye and for no fault of their own, saying you don't have a job anymore is, is a difficult thing to do. So things happen that you can't control. On to some Foundant components. Um, 2008, Great Recession. Excellent timing again. So we were actually at one of our first really big industry conferences. We had spent money on sponsorship. They'd given us a room. We were holding our first ever users conference. Almost half of our customers, it was like 15 people, but still, almost half of our customers were there, and the crash happened that day. So we were sitting there doing training. We had computers out, so there was no hiding from it. And all of a sudden, the news started coming through that the market was going down like you know significant percents, 40%, 30%. Um, I'll never forget, I was sitting with a client, and she leaned back, and keep in mind, we work with grant-making people, these have large endowments, right? And she's like, oh my god, we just lost $25 million off of our asset base. And I was like, oh boy, what's going to happen to our company? Um, and it was hard, you know, we had just doubled our staff almost, so we had increased the size of our staff from five to nine, which was a huge thing for us. Um, things were starting to really cook, and again, it ground to a halt. So lots of lost sleep, lots of things trying to work things through, and I'll say our, our employees worked with us. So we had a process there that we ceremoniously called the unraise. Everybody took $1,000 less per month in their paycheck. That went on for almost a year before we were able to get through it. So things that happen that are not your fault, that you have to roll with and plan for and be prepared with. And that's just part of owning your own company. On the other hand, sometimes you do things to yourself. So uh, if you're a tech company, you will screw up. At some point in time, that's just the way it works. Internet's gonna break, your servers are gonna blow up, whatever. Um, and I'll say this is, you know, if, if, if you are going this direction, best advice I can possibly give you is knowing how to say I'm sorry, you know? going out to clients, and we've had to do this twice that I can distinctly, where we had to give a heartfelt, I'm sorry, we screwed up, here's what we're gonna to do to fix it. If you don't do that, it can be a company killer. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Give Big from two years ago, 2016, and the, you know, the company that was kind of really promoting that, you know, their software was running it, kind of pushed everyone to do it on the same day because they wanted to be able to do this great PR release on how much money was collected over the course of the country over that period of time, and their system went down. And they didn't talk to their customers all day long. And their customers were talking to them on social media and everything else, and they just went black. And that company is almost out of business. I mean, they're starting to recover, but I mean, they've completely changed over their management. They've had to completely do things in a different way. So. Being able to say you're sorry is something that if, if you're not a person who can stand up in front of a large group and be like, yep, it's my fault or it's our fault, we're really sorry, this is not probably the direction for you to go because it's going to happen and it will be your fault at some point in time. So that's the startup side, um, which was, as I said, maybe kind of the bulk of it. Now I'm going to move into some of the scale things, just talk a little bit about that. And so um, I like to think of, you know, we just say scaling the business because it's like it scares people when you're like we're making this up as we go along and that is really understand the true joy of starting your own business is you get to make it up as you go along you get to make every decision as you're going along and it's you know you'll never know if it's right or wrong because you've already made that decision you've gone right left is no longer an option so I want to talk just real quick about some of the scaling issues that you deal with and different type of things to think about First ones, I consider them speed bumps, right? So, especially if you get your business cruising and you're making, you know, pretty good sales, products working fairly well, everything's, you know, you're, the velocity is starting to increase, and then, da -da -da -da, you know, all of a sudden you kind of have to stop for a second or you slow down because something's happened. And sometimes that's competitive, you know, competitor, competitors release some sort of feature that you have to go catch up with or have to, you know, figure out how to deal with. Sometimes it's like legal, um, so that used to be a big one for us. 
everyone wanted customized legal contracts. We don't have, and nor can we afford, our own attorney on staff. So that meant Darren or I reading through the contracts and not doing other things. So we instituted a $1,000 um, it's your paper fee. Uh, and actually, it's a thousand dollar discount as long as it's on our paper. Um, and guess what? We don't have nearly the number of legal contracts that we have to read anymore. Because once we put money on it and said you have to pay us to do this, they weren't. It really wasn't as important that they change this, the the venue from Montana to wherever they happen to be located. The other one, the security reviews, is killing us now. Um, so the number of deals that come through where they want to do a security review is just absolutely killing us. And um, it's legitimate, you know, you can't say no, but it takes Chris Dahl, who's our VP of technology, hours and hours and hours to fill this thing out. We're trying to figure this one out right now because every single one of them is different. And, you know, you can give them your SOC report and it doesn't do you any good. Um, they still have all the other things that they want to fill out. So these are the types of things that they're slowing us down and they're annoying and you have to deal with them or else it just gets really, really frustrating. Next one is incline. So things just get harder. As you build your business, you start to grow, you start to kind of get um, more and more behind you. Um, maintaining growth, you know, having a 30% renewal rate on, or in, increase in business on a $5 million number is way harder than one, one million. So those types of issues, dealing with employees, um, having to scale your operations. Most startups don't have a lot of operational support. At some point in time, you need to have operational support. You need somebody who's thinking that way. So these are the type of things that, you know, as a management team, you have to be thinking about and just kind of planning for because it's coming. You know, it's going to get harder. It doesn't get easier. Um, challenges become more, more, more and more severe as time goes on. Last one, or this is, I, I could have gone a different way with this one, but um, these are the things that keep you up at night. And there's, you know, and, and, and you don't want to have any single one of these issues come along, but you have to make sure that you continue to invest. So, you know, things like server failures, data loss, data privacy issues, that type of stuff, you constantly have to be thinking about investing, having a plan, and working on through it. And you have to, it's like insurance. You just have to do it in a way um, to kind of keep your business comfortable, safe, and moving forward. Um, but it's hard, and this is, you know, if, if, if any of you know Chris Dahl, who's our VP of technology, he, he, he's grumpy, and it's because of these things right here. You know, it's, this, it's, it's these type of issues that keep him awake and, and therefore makes him lose sleep. So those are scaling issues, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail on those just because every single company is gonna have different scale. Just understand that you have short-term, medium-term, and long-term, or like, you know, do not do this type of issues that you always have to be thinking about investing in and spending time. Shifting gears into starting a tech business in Montana. Um, I would actually say that starting a tech, and actually it's supported by the Kaufman study that just came out, starting a tech company in Montana is actually pretty easy. Um, you know, there's access to motivated people who want to live here, they're educated, they've come from different areas. You know, pulling together that initial band, not very hard really. Um, the idea and that allure of being able to start a successful business where you want to live, very seductive. Um, access to seed funding. There is seed funding here. Not necessarily VC money as easily, but seed funding. Wealthy individuals who are willing to take a, take a chance on you is definitely something that's readily available in, in Montana if you know how to go ask for it. And it's a fantastic peer environment. Events like this are obviously a huge thing. There's Prospera, there's Mon Montana High Tech Alliance. There's more and more growing resources going into you know, building up Montana's business. So that one to 25 people really wasn't that hard. When we hired people, we tended to know them from somebody else. You know, getting that part really wasn't that difficult. Scaling a business in Montana is a lot more difficult. And you, know, you can look at this and see that you know, kind of just across the businesses that have continued to grow. And it's things like adding employees. So probably our first close to 20, 25 employees, we knew something about them from somebody else and they had a direct connection to somebody who was already working for Foundant or was directly related to us. Um, after you get to 25, you just can't do that anymore. And so finding the right people is hard to do. Montana's tech community is still pretty small if we're honest with ourselves. So, you know, it's, and you know everybody. So it's not like you want to be constantly 
pulling people from, you know, the, these people who you're going to end up at dinner with and at conferences with. Um, so it, it's, it's a little harder to kind of keep, keep in the, the larger number of people. I mean, right now, they actually had to do a complete marketing campaign, do billboards, create a website, iloveithere.com, to bring people back. They work with MSU. So scaling it on the, on the employee side of it is a lot more difficult. On the other hand, that first 25, managing their expectations as you scale gets harder too, you know, because they're like, man, I've been here since day one. You're bringing in these people who have experience out of Seattle or Austin or wherever. You're pay I know you're paying them more. I've been here from the very beginning. What are you going to do? And it's fair, but it does make it harder to do because, you know, all of a sudden your cost for employees go up, goes up significantly and you're still trying to grow your business. Now I'm getting into some tactical things, but just finding office space. I remember Greg talking about this in 1998, that he couldn't find legitimate office space. It is still hard to do today. I went out onto LoopNet, which is the commercial um, office space, kind of realtor.com, and if I'm looking for a, a space that's between five to 10,000 square feet, there are five in Bozeman right now. And most of them aren't actually real. They're schematic drawings of what's going to be there down the road. So if you're scaling your business, you're in trouble. I went to Missoula and looked at that one. They had five. And again, not really, there's maybe one <laughs> that would really work for a high-tech company. Um, so office space is still an issue. And you, and you can tell because Zoot's built their own building. We built our own building. Oracle built their own building. Or right now built their own building. That's been our solution. Well, understand that when we go to build, to build our own building, we're taking resources away from building the business because now we have to build the building instead. Not a bad investment, but it takes us our eye off of the growth component. In comparison, I did the same search in, in San Francisco area. There's 550 um, uh, really good locations that they were able to, you know, between five and 10,000. So not hard for them to be able to find physical office space. Proper infrastructure. You know, if you are growing your business, you get really tired of that last hookup fee to bring fiber to your, to your office. We've had to do it three times. Where, you know, and, and again, San Francisco, it's already there. They've got fiber running through their entire building. We have to constantly kind of build up the infrastructure. And again, things are happening in Montana to make that more likely, but it's a hard component. We live and die off of our, off of our internet. So having good, reliable internet access is something that you know, we just have to have, and it's something you can't take for granted in different parts of the state. And then the last one is expert to, or access to expert resources. So this is the cabling guy. It's the sound, sound people. We do remote meetings constantly, and it is a pain in the neck. People on the, you know, who are working for us remotely can't hear what's going on because the audio is bad, and getting the people in to be able to take care of that. Access to VC, um, access to uh, all these you know, marketing automation consulting. I mean, we have some of it, but you have to realize in some of these other, or other places where we're competing with people, they have just a plethora of people available to help them build their business. And in Montana, we end up going it alone. We're doing it ourselves, and which just you know, makes us a better business in many, many ways, but it doesn't make start scaling your business that, that much easier. So that 25 to 100 people has been much, much harder. And so just you know, be familiar with that. And you can see that also in some of the companies that have been here that they start creating these remote offices and doing things differently because it's harder to scale it right here. And that's a problem that honestly everybody in this room needs to be working to solve. So that takes me to kind of my final component, which is what do we do to keep Montana's tech growing and moving forward? So first thing is, and I'm standing on a soapbox on this one, but we have to focus just as much on building the evergreen companies. The you know, PFL, um, Zoot, people like that in Bozeman, uh, that have been here for 15, 20 years doing tech companies. We need more people working in the tech industry. We can't just have you know, people who are trying to grow as fast as they possibly can and be the unicorns. On the other hand, we still need a couple of unicorns coming out of here. You know, we still need people to build their business up to a point where right now was and had one point, you know, and sold for 1.5 billion because that brings other attention to us here. So we have to do both, but you know, Maybe focus on the evergreen thing and see where, see where it takes you before you try and go straight for the unicorn side of it. The other one, and this is something that we've done significantly, 
at, at Foundic is you need, we need to be hiring and training more university students. So utilizing the U of M, utilizing MSU, utilizing all the different schools that are across um, Montana and bringing the students who are already here into the tech environment and teaching them how it works and what it works. Without that, I don't think I'd be standing on this stage right now. Okay? I met Darren at Extended Systems at the same time. I don't know if he would have been you know, in the same position. So that is an opportunity for every single person in this room is how do you get students involved and give them real relevant experience, treat them like tech employees so they stay here and continue on that component. And so I found that we have 18 MSU students who have jobs with us. We call them interns because we don't know what else to call them. Students doesn't seem right, but we pay them real money, they do real jobs, they handle our customer service, they work in marketing, we have them starting on QA, they do all sorts of different types of things, and these are people who have the ability to stay. And some of them have stayed with us, so that's a great deal, but others have gone on to work for Elixir, which is marketing automation. Some of them have gone on to work for other companies, and they have that tech experience and they're able to spread it. And I have no doubt that some of them may come together down the road and start their own thing. So please do take into consideration that we have an amazing resource from that perspective that can help you right now scale your business, but also can help this sector continue to grow. Because guess what? Most of them chose MSU or U of M or their relevant school for a reason. They wanted to be here and they want to be here longer term. And then the final thing that I, was gonna, I wanted to hit on is just, we have to continue to build up resources. If you have investment money, here's your idea. My money's all tied into Foundit, I can't do this. But, I mean, office space in these different locations, um, developing expertise and, and really becoming uh, an, an expert. I mean, we use Marketo, in Salesforce now for our businesses because Andrew at Elixir, Elixir was here to help guide us and I was like, I've got somebody who can actually help me. So we need to bring in more and more consultants who have expertise around different things. And then the final one, it's legitimate to talk about investment opportunities. We have to keep doing, um, we have to get outside of our comfort zone and continue to be willing to grow our business. And, and that does mean working with VCs. It does mean working with other people who are gonna make money off of your hard work, um, which is something that kind of rubs Montanans raw. But you know, we have to do some of these things if, if it's gonna become, you know, be on a high state of mind for people. Montana's very um, popular right now. You can't be on an airplane without hearing some investment mm -hmm. baker talk about their small company that they're part of in both in Montana, it seems like. But that's not gonna last without us creating some significant businesses that are here and you know, allowing ourselves to share some of that opportunity with other people. So, that was my, my things. I wanna wrap up with any questions, comments, other points of view that people may have.